Hi, everyone. My name is Peter Pasque, and I'm a lecturer for the University of Michigan School of Ed. I focus on technology integration, and I also am uh, a technology lead teacher for Ann Arbor Public Schools. Uh, I've been doing that for about 10 years now, and I've um, also in the past been a design tech teacher. I did that for about 12 years. Currently, I've been doing a lot of work with makerspaces, and uh, for about five years now, I've been organizing the Ann Arbor Open, um, Ann Arbor Open Schools uh, Mini Maker Fair and Project Lead the Way Expo. And this year, I've been helping to organize and rebrand Ann Arbor's Mini Maker Fair to the ACME, um, uh, which uh, stands for the Ann Arbor Creativity and Maker Expo. Um, I'm also a husband and dad, and um, you can see to the right, my daughter and I made skateboards this year for the Ann Arbor Open uh, Mini Maker Fair, and uh, she's my, my greatest maker experiment. Um, we like to design and build things together all the time, and uh, we find it uh, a great bonding thing and um, uh, a great uh, way to, to try out new ideas. Um, <clears throat> so this presentation, uh, I'm going to be operating from, um, you know, my frame of reference, obviously. Um, so as an ed tech coach, as a design tech teacher, and as an organizer and participant of Maker Fairs. Um, I'm going to turn my, my uh, video off and um, uh, present the rest uh, this way. So here we go. Um, basically, I like to solve problems uh, with others and uh, for others. And if I'm doing things correctly, uh, I'm working in the middle of, of this diagram, you know, uh, fun projects that are useful and interesting, um, often challenging uh, and, and rewarding. So if, if we truly are in the middle of this uh, diagram, it, really the, the projects are, are challenging and interesting and more, and, uh, you know, typically end up with a good uh, bonding um, possibility for the, the students and as well as the uh, adults and uh, kids at the same time. So through the years, I've been doing this stuff for about 20 years now, um, I've identified four of what I consider the most important issues facing makers in school libraries. And I'm sure a lot of this can translate to the public library as well. Um, but number one, is the need to establish value to the school community. Although it may seem us of our value, it's um, obvious to the rest of the school staff. And so we wanna make sure that we are, are um, constantly bringing that to light and, and helping people understand our value added piece. Two, we need to figure out ways to turn buy-in into sustained use. So it's not like a one-time participation um, thing with a class or a club or an organization or an outside sponsor or a community member. Three, we wanna stay relevant to the classroom and um, make sure that, again, we're a value-added piece to extending the learning in the class. And four, we need to fight the, um, the feeling of becoming stymied that um, I, I need to be an expert in everything maker. And this, um, you know, sometimes can be a little stumbling block for me um, with starting a project in the makerspace when I feel like, um, you know, geez, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this or I barely know how to do some of the stuff that I know the students are going to want to explore. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, encouraging the, uh, the failure as success idea and uh, getting different resources and uh, participants in the maker space uh, can help us overcome that fear and uh, get the ball rolling. And I think that's a real important component as well. So I'm gonna address all of those. And um, I, I always operated from the idea that we can get what we need by solving the problems of others, whether this is for our, our school library, our, our district library, or our classroom. Um, I think this is a beneficial way to operate and, and place to, uh, to start. So if 
uh, another way to look at this is make, make sure that we make our space more about them than it is about anything else. Our kids could tell if maker spaces or any of our spaces are, are really student centric and designed for them to, to take an ownership uh, level uh, in the space and really to be able to be free to explore and to gain um, safety and security from, from grownups uh, as well as support to help them uh, be successful in whatever endeavor they're, they're uh, exploring. So um, an old shop class. So my, my first classroom was in an old shop class. I was hired to, I was hired to convert a wood shop uh, class into a modern design tech or or um, ed tech classroom or design tech classroom. Uh, the problem that I had was uh, I uh, all my students thought they signed up for wood shop, and all the you know a bunch of different teachers, a principal, the custodians are telling me, oh look, these guys are going to come in your class, they're going to eat you alive. They, they you know they ran the other teacher out of here, and uh, you know good luck, buddy. And so, you know, my first day of, of class, you know, the kids came in and, um, you know, I asked them a question. I said, you know, look around, what, what's new in this room? And they looked around and all day I got two, two answers, you and the door is open. And they're right. I said, look at this equipment in here. This equipment would have been old when I was in school. It is at least 50 year old equipment. The tables had big cracks down the middle of them were barely held together. Everything was old. I said, look, you guys are you're stuck in the back of the school with this old equipment. And how often does a principal come down here and visit you guys in class? I'm like, never, you know, or just, to, you know, to, to take someone down to the office. And uh, so I said, okay, it's up to you guys to get new equipment for this classroom. And the students started shuffling in their seats and looking at each other like, this guy wants us to steal stuff for the class. And so I explained to them, I said, look, the way you're gonna get new equipment for this classroom is by doing really amazing uh, work uh, with the projects that I give you. My job is to make sure that I'm coming up with really innovative, exciting projects um, for you to work on and for you to, uh, to work through, and then to publicize the amazing work that you're doing. And what we're gonna do is, we're gonna show everybody this amazing work that you're doing with this old equipment and then we're going to convince them, just imagine what we could do if we had new equipment. And so by the end of the, uh, by the, end of the first semester, actually, we had uh, four different computers in the classroom. We had two uh, digital cameras, which were, um, you know, brand new on the market uh, for consumer uh, cameras at the time. And we had commandeered uh, the VHS recorders and uh, hooked them up to the computers so we could make tutorial videos for each other. Um, about how to do different uh, things in the classroom. So it was a really empowering environment for the kids. Um, it was an exciting uh, place to be for me. And I think that uh, we really um, made great grounds um, re-engaging our kids in the school, as well as uh, building up our program to something that everyone was proud of. So the, with the issues that we have, um, to our maker community. So uh, establishing value to the school community. What problem do we have to solve for the for teachers? And I think that our, the biggest problem we can help solve is time. Librarians need more time, teachers need more time, administrators need more time, but maker spaces can help teachers extend the classroom and deepen learning, personalize the curriculum. We can create authentic experiences. We can engage students. We can help with project-based learning. Um, assignments, and we can um, do a lot of the legwork in preparation um, for for teachers, as well as bringing community members in as resources for the students and for the staff. Um, I think this is, you know, this cooperation and developing lessons together um, can really help reduce the amount of time reduce the amount of time it takes for to create a really robust, um, authentic experience for our kids. So how do we turn buy-in into sustained use? I'm a big fan of motivating folks by jealousy. So pick one or two early adopters in your school that, um, you know, that, that are your allies, that, that are your go-to people. 
and and ask them and invite them to collaborate with you on one or two projects um, in, in a term and um, make sure it's something that you know is targeting their learning objectives and goals and you know you know co-decide what what this project is going to be to enhance their classroom and, and what they already have planned or what they're going to do and um, you know it invite them to hold the class in the library and if, if that's where your maker space is and um, you can create sort of a, a clean lab and dirty lab you know where the the kids are designing or coming up with ideas in one space and then um, coming into the uh, maker space to uh, uh, to fabricate something or to take photographs or make videos or whatever it is that your uh, maker space um, and project uh, has and, and needs. Um, if you can schedule classes before launch or right before the end of the school day and you know that will allow kids to continue working into their own time uh, on projects that they're engaged in and um, have uh, excitement about. And then, um, you know, present uh, at least a couple times a year at staff meetings and at parent-teacher conferences and maybe even the McCall conference uh, where you're highlighting the exciting things that your kids are doing with the things that you have, which again, will will encourage other folks to to say, hey, look, wow, you're doing this. I have this these resources that I think would benefit you. Here, let me give you some in-kind resources or you know, let me um, give you some some um, materials that you guys can have and use. Um, and then, of course, bring experts in from the community to help um, help bolster your expertise and to help draw on the expertise from the community. So, how does buy-in and sustained use look and feel? I think it really ends up coming from uh, a continued use of a non-traditional space. So. You know, your maker space can also be a, a presentation space. What we've done at Skyline High School is we've um, experimented with creating a presentation space in the library where the kids and staff can um, reserve that space to present during lunch or during classes. So what some teachers will do is when they have a guest speaker come in, they will reserve this space. It's a, a little different, a little more exciting, um, and um, it has a uh, different resources available uh, from our, our media center and our maker space. And um, they present there. We have had a lot of teachers and students uh, pre practice presentations during lunchtime in front of their peers, um, as well as hold formal presentations um, in, in there during lunch or after school. Um, it's a, a great non-traditional way to get the kids um, in, the, in the maker space and thinking about um, pitching ideas and, and practicing presentations in a more authentic way. Um, it's also an extension of the classroom. I think I alluded to that before. You know, we can get you know, teachers to hold class in this space and near the space to, to be able to utilize the materials. And um, you know, I, I really think that low tech is often the best tech. You know, use whatever technology is, is the right tool for the job it doesn't always need to be a you know laser printer or a, um, a, a, an etcher. Um, you know it could be uh, some woodworking tools or um, you know it could even be hot glue and and popsicle sticks if that if that's what uh, what the project calls for. And make sure that you're promoting what's happening in your space. As librarians and teachers, we're generally uh, pretty modest folks, but you know. Think of it as promoting what it, the kids are doing in your space. And that can um, help overcome some of the feelings of modesty when uh, you know people are reluctant to self-promote. But we need to promote in order to get things for our kids and get gain opportunities for our, our students or the people that we're serving. And um, invite clubs and groups to um, use your space. Maybe you want to pick um, a club that uh, could meet in your space during um, one semester, and they'd be able to use the equipment that would complement whatever it is that they're meeting to, to do. So using non-traditional um, techniques and, and ideas in your space is, is beneficial. And staying relevant to the classroom. So partnering with teachers on collaborative projects. You can see this uh, photo um, on the slide. There, 
these girls made campaign posters for social studies class. Um, you know, they used the photography station in our maker space. And then um, we helped them out with some Photoshop um, um, skills to uh, make some pretty dynamic campaign posters. Uh, you know, partnering with the community um, and bringing experts in to create um, authentic learning opportunities. Maybe the kids are, are presenting to experts in your space. And then of course, tracking usage and so that you, know, you can justify uh, expenditures or, or continued investment in, in what your initiatives are. Um, you know, we can also be a big benefit, uh, we can also benefit classrooms uh, that are implementing Genius Hour or, you know, a lot of teachers are nervous about the next gen science standards and all the engineering um, that's required of them in there, um, in that curriculum. And we can also help benefit project-based learning curricula as well. In partnering with teachers, here are a few ideas of, of things that you can do with different um, disciplines. You, know, you can get the graphic arts kid to brand um, your makerspace and also to, um, to promote and create uh, posters for uh, upcoming projects and, and help publicize things that are, are happening and uh, upcoming for uh, the makerspace. With physics, you can do, you know, mousetrap vehicles, simple machines, uh, simple circuits, social studies, campaign posters. You can also help uh, with student government for campaigning and uh, advertising. Um, I think that stop motion animations and dioramas with linkages and gears and moving parts are a great um, uh, way to integrate language arts classes into the makerspace. And try out hexaflexagons with math. Um, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, measuring techniques and estimating, um, a lot of algebra and geometry that can be integrated into uh, hands-on projects. And science, you know, Project Nest Watch through Cornell University, uh, a great program of citizen science. You can build uh, birdhouses and plant them throughout the campus and then monitor them on a regular basis and report your, um, your findings to Project Nest Watch. I've done this uh, project um, over the years with uh, special ed classes. And um, it's a great way to learn um, um, responsibility, uh, taking care of the environment, um, graphing, charting, and reporting uh, real data to, um, to help out uh, Cornell's Ornithology Lab. Partnering with the community, um, I think this is really a, a way where experts can play a, a role in supporting you. And um, I find that when I want to integrate something I'm, I'm uncomfortable with or, or not an expert on, I, if I bring in, a, in an expert to, uh, to run a project with the kids, um, either during the day or after school, and I can sit in on this um, and participate with the students, and build my skills and then i can um you know i can feel more comfortable to run something like this in the future and to support projects as they um as they evolve in, in the maker space um, experts can also help out with project launches and gain um, and garner uh, excitement and support throughout the school um, also a lot of a lot of uh, our community members are happy to support via uh, Skype or FaceTime throughout the day if there's a, a problem that we can't solve. And um, again, they, they, they like to come in and, and see the final presentations by the students. And um, I, you know, it does, the companies that you bring in should reflect the community. So uh, regardless of what your community uh, makes or, or has resources, uh, you know, what, what types of resources they are, you know, invite them in, the print, local printing company or, or, you know, architecture, biomedical, you see some examples down here at the bottom, whatever it is, um, you know, leverage that to your, uh, to benefit your students. So this feeling of being stymied by the need to be an expert in everything maker, the thing that you bring to the maker space is good teaching practices. Even if you don't feel like you have uh, a, a creative bone in your body, you know, your good teaching practices can help make this and sustain this makerspace. So, you know, creating solid routines 
that helps the students and teachers feel comfortable and knowing what to expect in your space to um, you know, design thinking models uh, or using the scientific process. These are great ways to um, uh, lay out a project and, and uh, a way to think about a project, a process of tackling a complex project. And these models are, um, are, are excellent ways to, um, to help your students think through something and the routines that they can apply every time they're faced with a new challenge. Also, you should establish regular meeting times, you know, um, maybe twice a week during lunch, you're open for, um, for drop-in sessions or after school for an hour or two for uh, drop-in sessions um, on certain days and then run specific programs when you've got um, some, you know, uh, a project that you want to, uh, to work on. Maybe you're doing a, a soldering lab or you're doing a, um, a knitting project Maybe um, you know it's a uh, electronics or a, a Raspberry Pi project, and you're bringing in somebody from the community to help run it, and they're going to run it with you for a week, and then you can extend it uh, from there. But establishing the regular meeting times so that the kids can build into their busy schedules a time when they're going to be in your your maker space, and again promote promote promote. You know um, the idea again of look what we can do with this junk. Now just imagine what we can do if we had some real supplies and tools. And I use that um, argument um, as a funding solution when I'm writing grants or pitching ideas to the, um, to the school board or the PTSO. Um, you know, remember uh, all, you know, um, all the local stores need to, um, to, to, they generally have uh, grants, they need to give away money. You know, Meyer has um, has grants that they offer. Best Buy has offers um, for teachers and uh, librarians to get supplies. You know, tap into your resources and be innovative. And our kids are tool starved. You know, they they really have a need to uh, to get tools in their hands and to use them. And so, please help feed them. You know, uh, get tools in their hands, even if it's low tech tools or or high tech tools. It, you know. I'm a big fan of this and of these um, uh, finding the right tool for the job, and your kids will remember these experiences, um, and they will uh, come back and thank you for them in the future. So you can see in the lower left-hand corner, I have some contact information, my Twitter handle, and my email. If you're interested in talking further or or um, you know have something you want to share, um, please you know don't hesitate to contact me. And since this presentation is going to be up um, uh, posted, my slides will be posted as well. I've also added some additional resources that may help you. Here's some um, stuff of, uh, on hexaflexagons, and by heart site is, is really dynamic and amazing. Here's my design thinking cheat sheet, you know, I, 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 and the resource I got this from. Um, other design thinking models uh, from IDEOs in Singapore. Um, here's a, you know, again, design thinking. This is uh, Singapore's design thinking that they modified from IDEO, the scientific method. Here are reviews for educational technology tools from Common Sense Media and EdSurge. They're reviewed for teachers by teachers. Um, and here are some tech integration frameworks so you can kind of figure out um, uh, where you are in the spectrum of integrating technology into the classroom and, or makerspace and um, where you may want to go. This is a, a triple E framework from the University of Michigan that um, targets more, um, more learning objectives than the tool, where this, uh, this one from Ruben Putendura's um, SAMR model kind of focuses more on the tool than on the learning objectives. So I hope that you found this useful and um, um, I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks so much, Thanks Pete. So much, Pete.